This is where we talk about how we grow both a powerful brand and business and life as well, because everything's connected. Welcome to Brand and Biz Bills. I'm Debbie White. I've spent 30 years in the creative advertising industry, working with Fortune 500 brands, while also being a serial entrepreneur, building several multiple six and seven figure businesses along the way. I'm talking with other powerful women to share insider secrets and insights about building your brand and business. And I don't have time for BS and fluff. You don't either. So let's get to building a powerful brand and business with some real Frank talk. Follow me on Instagram at frankly Deb so we can connect further. Hey, we are here today with a very special guest. I'm so excited for y'all to meet this person sitting right next to me. Uh, this is Bianca Barrett. Bianca Barrett is a senior contributor for Forbes Women. Uh, she's coming to us from London and she has written for the Sunday Times, Refinery29, Cosmopolitan, Evening Standard, Independent, BBC. I'm probably missing some, but <laughs> Bianca, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Debbie. I'm very much looking forward to this. I'm so excited to have you. Um, I have to admit something. Go on. I was lucky enough to be featured in Forbes and lucky enough to be interviewed by no other than you, Bianca. So yeah. that's how we met. I mean, well, we met before that, but that's how this all came to be. Um, I have a question that this, this one is just, I'm curious. How hard is it like really to get featured in Forbes? Cause that's just phenomenal. I was so floored. I mean, that's a whole nother story. I know I jumped up. I remember when you told me I started dancing on a zoom. I think I jumped up and screamed. I don't even know what I did, but how, how hard is it? You know what? It's, it's interesting because I think for me, it's very easy sitting on my side of the desk <laughs> to to forget that it's um that it's really quite a big thing you know sometimes that sounds I'm honestly not trying to be falsely modest here like it honestly there are times when I sort of forget that it's such it can actually be really um pretty profound for some people yeah. but in terms of how hard it is you know what I, I always say the same thing. I think if you just look at the numbers, it can feel impossible. So for mm -hmm. example, I probably receive around a hundred pitches a day for Forbes. Wow. And I write around two pieces a month. <laughs> okay. So, so it are, seems, okay. you know, yeah. You just yeah. think what's wow. the point, you know, what is the point? Mm -hmm. But uh, First of all, some people write a lot more regularly than I do. I just go into a lot of depth with my pieces. Um, yeah. And I'm very picky now about who I write about and the topics I cover, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously why I wanted to feature you. Um, um, so, yeah, so I think it, it all really depends on the quality of the pitch. Yeah. Um, and that's something you've heard me talk about before. And I, yes. I talk to a lot of people about that you really uh, rapidly increase and better your odds if you know how to nail the pitching process. Mm. So yeah, that's, it's not a definitive answer, I'm afraid, but yeah, kind of, okay. yeah. Well, I, easy, think it's a, I think it's a question that if I, if I, you know, like I'm sitting here, I told her like, we're just sitting here having a glass of wine, Bianca and I, and it's like, I'd want yeah. to ask that. Like, how hard does it really come on, Bianca? How yeah. hard is it? So the odds are like, okay, so, a really great pitch. I know you teach this as well. Yeah. And you have, uh, you know, and I have learned from you. Um, okay. What, what, what is the number one thing that would like stand out on a great pitch? Like what catches your, what catches your attention? Oh, okay. So there are a few things that I love to see. I mean, I think one of the main ones is that whoever's pitching me actually has looked at my work and I don't just mean spent five minutes scanning yes. the headlines of the pieces I've written like they've taken some time to okay. read some of my pieces 
And it's not just to flatter me and, you know, make me feel great. Although, you know, that always helps, I say, <laughs> if you're pitching right. someone. But it's it's for you as well. It's it's for the person pitching to sort of, it's, it's your best insight into how to send a pitch that they're actually going to like. So for right. me, that's a big one. Okay. And then, oh my God, the massive one is you honestly it's um, it still astounds me how many people including people who work for PR agencies yeah who pe- you know are being paid a lot to do this work on behalf of their clients it astounds me how many people send pitches that are so self-absorbed so kind of like really about mm. I'm great or my clients great this is why you should feature them or feature me mm. and and I think, sorry, it really just yeah, like it really gives this like oh. vibe to me that it's like it's like I'm not, I'm not like a member of your staff, you know, what I mean? like yeah. you need to send me something that's going to be valuable to me and to my audience. Okay, so right and I think, there. you know, yeah, and and you know what, this is not to say, look, it's not that every you know, like everyone who pitches is like really got a, an inflated ego. I think it's just, it's a common misconception yeah, that people think yeah. that's what you need to do. You need to like really impress with your story. And of course, yes, we want to see what your successes have been, what your experiences mm-hmm. and your expertise, but actually it's more about, well, yeah, but what, what is, what are we meant to be taking away from your story? You know, unless you're kind of, I would say it's like, unless you're Carly, like Kylie Jenner or Kim Kardashian. Or well, I think that's the problem. I mean, yeah, right? It's, I it's, think but people it's like, think they're supposed to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's like, you know, and that's not to say I, I love those people, but it's kind of yeah. like, I, it's not going to fly. Like, I'm not going to be able to just write a story about your, your journey into business. Because what, what's going to make the audience click on that piece and open it? You know what I mean? I Unless absolutely. it's something they can learn from it. Well, and this goes back to, I can say for marketing, you know, that's my wheelhouse. Your wheelhouse is PR. We were talking about how marketing and PR go hand in hand, right? There's a lot of things oh, yeah. that go hand in hand, but this is the same for both. Everything I teach, and this is the same, it goes to PR. Every, every piece of content you're creating when you're creating your brand it's not about you. It's actually all about the audience. Always, yeah. always, yeah. always, always. Even if you're telling yeah. a story about yourself, it's what can they learn from that? What can they mm-hmm. benefit from that? What can your audience, what takeaways will your audience have? And I'm astounded how many people miss that too in marketing. Yeah. 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 But that's the way all storytelling is right even like every film every tv program every book you read yes it might be to entertain you but Uh, people come out of those experiences talking about the effect it had on them yeah and what they think of it it's how it's it's like it's always about the audience it's like the audience has the power and the audience are metabolizing it in their own way. So if you come to me and you don't know what the audience is, is, is supposed to be getting out of it, then it makes, it, it doesn't make an appealing prospect for me. It's a bit like I, so, right. so for example, I, I'm, so I'm writing a, a novel, which is really, really hard. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, it's definitely knocked me down a peg or two in terms of my, my how good I think I am at writing. It's like very challenging. Um, yeah. But something I say about that, and I have a writing group and we talk about, is that you might say, well, if somebody said, well, what's this, what's your story? What, you know, tell me about the book. And you'd say, well, it's the story of, X, Y, Z, but it's actually a story about ABC. Uh, so if I were going to talk about, um, I don't know, Finding Nemo, right? He okay. say, well, it's a story of a small fish who gets lost and his dad goes looking for him. But it's actually a story about bravery and courage mm-hmm. and 
not taking for granted the love that you have in your life. Do you mm. see the difference? It's like, of course. Yeah. So it's like one on the one hand, it's that's like, well, this is the this is the kind of mechanic of the story. Mm-hmm. And that's the pit, bit most people stop at where they say, well, these are my experiences and this is how great I am. And they forget the second part, which is so necessary for the audience. It's like, but, but what I've learned from this and what your audience will take from this or what I can offer your audience is that through this experience, I learn blah, 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 which right. because I've learned it, I can advise them so they don't have to make the same mistake and learn it themselves. There you go. Yeah. And you know, it's so interesting. I'm sitting here listening to you. That's, that's what we do in marketing. It's, yeah. it's really very similar, actually. It's storytelling. Yeah. What's in it for them? I mean, yeah. with PR, this is interesting to talk about, just kind of thinking about what I could ask you. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, you know, I think a lot of people have ma- major misconceptions about what they should be doing with marketing. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> first of all, they think they should be selling like an ad and that does not work anymore at all. It just doesn't flat out work. It's building relationships Mm -hmm. and offering value. And it's a longer relationship cycle to get the client with PR. Where did people benefit? What do you feel? And especially now that so much is digital, I know I'm kind of folding two questions into that, but what do you say overall, why should people even consider PR and why should people consider PR if maybe they don't even have the budget or they're, they're not anywhere close to being, you know, Kylie Jenner, why should, yeah. why should, why should, should people consider PR? I mean, I know the answer, but I okay. want to hear what you have to say. So as you know, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer. Yeah. So I always come at this from a journalist's perspective. So I'm kind yeah. of on the inside track and for anyone who doesn't know, but I'm sure most of your audience do because of, of the way they work with you, but PR is about, getting yourself into the media, building your profile. Um, and yeah, it's, it costs a lot. You know, if you, if you were going to hire PR, it can be valuable because it means you can delegate that to people yeah. who perhaps have a really great network of, um, you know, people working in the media industry that they can introduce you to, pitch you to X, Y, Z. But As I said, like most, I think the cheapest PR retainers I know of are sort of $5,000 a month. Wow. And And that's so it's a lot of money, right? And the reason it's a lot of money is because getting into the media is one of, you know, like you said, it comes back to marketing. It's one of the most valuable marketing, marketing tools you can use because it's third party endorsement. Mm. so it's not you saying you're great it's not your friends and acquaintances saying you're great it's a totally uninterested third party that your audience trusts because they already have brand reputation right right that is saying you're great that's what it is and it's it's also getting you out there on you know if you get into a massive media title like Forbes for example it's putting yeah. you out there on a platform that millions of people are looking at every single day yeah um and it's just that seal of approval you know it's like it's like when you see a product has been endorsed by the good housekeeping institute or which best buy or whatever you know it has these kind of stamps of approval and you think oh it must be good or like oh it was featured in vogue you know if there's like a beauty product that was sort of one of vogue's best or uh you know it's been in l or oprah uses it or whatever it's it's that it's a stamp of of approval from a pre-existing brand that people are dazzled by and that they trust so what makes it so valuable is that it it just makes it so much easier for you to sell (laughs) because people feel that they can trust you know that trust journey is a lot shorter because like you said like in marketing you're always looking to add value it takes longer to build that trusting relationship before people buy it does but if you if you incorporate doing your own pr and getting yourself into the media and raising your profile, then that trust journey is a lot shorter. And the good news is, you know, I just said that PR costs a lot of money. 
you yeah. don't have to have PR companies doing it for you. You can do it for yourself, which is obviously we've talked about this many times. Yes. This is something I consult on, you know, always coming from the point of view of a journalist. Um, and I, you know, speak to all my journalist friends and, and get them to weigh in on the topic as well. And it's, yeah, it's completely fine to do it for yourself. In fact, I know a lot of my journalist friends prefer to hear directly from people with stories sometimes, you know? I heard you say that and that about blew me away. I'm like, wait a minute, you're, the journalists would rather hear from people themselves than like the fancy PR firms. And you're like, and you call them PRs. And it's like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Did y'all hear yeah. that? Isn't that crazy? Cause I bet people listening to this are thinking, but I'm just this little solopreneur, small business. I have, you know, whatever. I mean, like really, and you specialize in helping people like this. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, right? It's, I think there is a lot of, um, imposter syndrome, people oh, thinking, yeah. what have I got to say? Why would anyone listen to what I have to say about what I do? Um, and it's so interesting to me because I think we all do the same thing, right? Where we we forget what we've achieved or we often downplay it or things that, that to other people seem wild to us is just like normal, you know? Yeah. Um, and it can be really difficult to see for ourselves what is impressive about what we've done or what other people could learn from what we've done. Exactly. And actually if, you know, what I would say to anyone listening to this, if you are sort of nodding along and saying, yeah, that's how I feel. I'm, you know, quite afraid of it. And I feel like, why would anyone care what I have to say? Ask your friends and acquaintances, you know, with an honest conversation, just say, look, you know, I'm not asking you to boost my ego here, but I want to work on getting into the media. And I'd love to know if you, um, you know, what is it, that you think is impressive about my business or what I've done or what do you think based on what you know about the way I work on my business you think I could sort of offer other people advice on and that's a really good place to start and if that feels too awkward just think back to every time you tell people what you do and what your business is let's say you're at a dinner party or a drinks thing and we've talked about this before what are the questions they ask you first what are the questions you get most often about your work and your job because that's the stuff that people want to know, you know? So, so that I think is a good place to start to work out what value you can actually be adding. And the thing is everyone can add value. Yeah. And I, and it's interesting because um, you actually came and talked to our house of impact group and a mm -hmm. lot of our members started working with you, which is so amazing. Yeah. And they're so excited. And when you came in and you gave a really cool talk about the potential for, for public relations, PR, and what that means, and you asked some of these questions, I did some follow-up calls with them or, you know, just on, on our yeah. program. And I'm going to tell you, I'm really glad you brought this up. The imposter syndrome is so big. Oh, yes. So big. That's where I fielded most of the questions was who am I? Why, why, what would I possibly have to say? And we sat there and role played and the whole group got involved. And sure enough, when the, when the whole group is also reflecting, it's not just me. They're like, oh, well, yeah, that's true. I kind of have done that. Oh uh -huh, yeah. 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 We all do that. Now this is all women, you know, Yeah, women are say. pros at this. Mm -hmm. Women are pros at this. Any, any other thing you could speak to just uh, you know, cause you've interviewed a lot of women for, for Forbes women and this imposter syndrome is, does it know no bounds? Does every woman have this or like, what's going on with imposter syndrome? I just feel compelled to like ask this question. Cause Honestly, it's I think, yeah, I think everyone, every woman has it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, do you ever I have think, imposter you know, syndrome? Oh my God. Yeah. What? All the time. You know, no! I saw, I, not a yeah. Vogue. Sorry, I just screamed. Not a Vogue. Like, I mean, a Vogue, a Forbes uh, yeah. editor. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Of See? course. Like, there are people, you know, there are, there are stories I would love to write. And I'm like, oh, where, where could I pitch that to? Uh, don't forget, guys, I pitch too. 
So when I talk about pitching, I'm in the trenches with you, but I'm pitching to editors to be a writer rather than to get PR. But so I know I'm I'm in that, like, a, yeah, I'm doing the work alongside you. So I totally get it. But and, it. and that's where my imposter syndrome can come in sometimes. And particularly when I think about where I want my career to go. Okay. Sometimes it's like, that's crazy. You know, like, is that really, you know, is that really going to happen? Or maybe, maybe, you know, you need to sort of, be a bit more realistic and I think often you know with women it's because we've learned to stay small or to be amenable and Mm -hmm. to you know that if if you're if you're too forthright with your achievements or ambition or whatever then it's seen in a negative light Mm-hmm. Um, it's very hard to win as a woman to get the right balance that suits everyone. And the truth is it's not going to suit everyone and that's totally fine. <laughs> but that's I think as point. well, it, it's, yeah, but it's also, I think a lot of people are afraid to be really honest with themselves about what they want in their wildest dreams, mm-hmm. because once they've really voiced that or articulated that thought, then if it doesn't happen, then they're going, they're risking massive disappointment is how they feel. It's like, oh, I'd rather just not try because Mm -hmm. then I can't be disappointed because we all know that sting of rejection, right? And disappointment and how it can make us really question our self-worth and it brings up a lot of old trauma and it can be very triggering. So often I think that's what the deeper underlying issue is that people have to overcome to think well maybe I have got something to share that that other people want to hear you know I I think just about everybody I meet has something to share Mm -hmm. I mean I I just there's so many people are so fascinating I know know? you know what's what it's it's what's wild as well so I was I actually had a chat and I I won I won't say her name but it's somebody one of your your women that you work with. Oh, wonderful! I had a session with her, and you know, she the other day, and she's like, "Oh, I'm really nervous about the session," and it's like, "Oh, it's going to be great," and you know, she's like, "Oh, I'm just not sure what I have to share or what I have to say," and then she just dropped into the conversation. Oh yeah, I um, yeah, I actually was like, I organized this sort of street art uh, event with my friend, and we showcased our art on the street, and I got scouted to do a, an exhibition at a gallery that that houses Picasso and and other like old masters and I was like okay you can stop right there like that's your story that's what you need to be pitching I for the story I will I will tell you later okay. <laughs> um but it's I it's t- I'm just like hang on <laughs> that's amazing and like we were saying sometimes it takes somebody else yeah. to pull you up and be like wait a minute how do you not see that that is a really amazing achievement you know and I think we just get we we just downplay it so much for ourselves right, right. Um, we do or you know hide or all kinds of things but I love yeah. I love your thinking on how a lot of us uh might do that might just be afraid to voice what we really 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 want and desire yeah. just fear of rejection Oh, but yeah. there's so much more. And then when you do, that's the thing. There's yeah. so much available. It ju- there just is. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting too, because I know that you happen to specialize in highlighting uh, trailblazers, like female trailblazers in business. And you're especially uh, particular about debunking much of the stigma that surrounds women and yeah. women in the workplace. Um, what do you see as far as what we were just talking about specifically to women entrepreneurs? Cause a lot of our followers are, have their own businesses. Do you mean in terms of stigma? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Where do we start? I mean, like <laughs> female entrepreneurs and business owners, obviously at the moment get something ridiculous, like 2% of VC funding. Mm. Um, I think often women are particularly they're often not taken as seriously as men and so it's harder to close deals um and to get 
bigger clients to the table. Um, and these are things that are not their fault, right? This is kind of patriarchal society and bias yeah. and ways of thinking that are kind of still holding women right. back, particularly female entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think as well, the kind of, um, particularly female entrepreneurs who work from home or fit their business around their family, there can be this kind of underlying um, bias that, oh, maybe that, you know, they're not really serious about their business or yeah. they're not really, they're not really, they're, they're only doing it as like a side project. Oh, that one, that one readiness. stings. That one stings mm-hmm. a lot. I've heard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 My little side project. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Debbie? Have you had, what's been your experience of that? You know, I have had a much more positive experience with this current, uh, business that I have, which is coaching women because I specialize in coaching women. So I've kind of created like, and this is where I think is interesting. And we talked about this too, about, I'm really looking at it from a couple different places is one, there is this collective online community of women in itself. And at one point talking to you, I likened them to a, their own country. And, yeah. I, and I think that's what your ears perked. I'm like, and if all women were their own country, it'd be the most powerful country in the world and yeah. sure buying power alone. So if I look at that world, like you step into that world of, um, you know, I'm really here for the women business owners. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is their own little, you know, it's our own, and you can kind of have that online. It becomes yeah. this really cool. Uh, I've kind of curated, if you will, because of the algorithm, there's, there's a good side to it is I think I have like 90, I think 96% of my followers are female. It might even be 98. It's something insane. Wow. Um, so it's very like much my niche now. And it's such a positive, amazing space because yeah. that's evolved. So I don't have all the negative Mm. stuff in that world. And when you're surrounding each other, it's kind of like what it must be like to go to an all girls, you know, college or something. I never had that experience, but there is something very empowering of empowering each other, Mm -hmm. of lifting each other up, being there for each other. And then we literally do commerce with each other. Yeah. So it kind of is its own amazing container of you know, I work with a lot of other coaches. I, I coach a lot of women. I like to buy products and services from other women. I'm not saying I don't work with men. I do. Um, I absolutely do, but it's a very supportive place. Now, when I had my ad agency, that was a whole different story because I was Mm -hmm. working with a lot of patriarchal systems. And I actually got, I I had a hard time. I had a hard time talking with C-suite, um, even women and feeling like I was being taken seriously sometimes. And, uh, that was very hard. And the other thing is in the world I was running around in all the guys were like kind of your classic, I'm going to just say, let it rip. I mean, you know, they're your classic older white men and they all played golf. I was like, I'm not going to, I don't play golf. Like, what am I supposed to do? I was like, you need to go do something and go play golf with that CMO or you're not going to keep the business. It's like, I don't play golf. I'm not going to go out with these guys. And like, it's such a weird world. So that that was really hard. Yeah. You have to play it their way or you're left out. But even when you play it their way, it's like you are judged for that too so it's like you can't win I kind of felt like I couldn't I mean the comments I would get weird comments about things like I'd go up to the C level of my client and I'd run into some Mm -hmm. of the you know people on the board and stuff and you would get comments of like weird stuff like your eyes look different it's like what I mean it's just like the weirdest stuff would come out of these guys mouths I'm like what are we doing here what Hmm. it's just weird stuff I mean just weird stuff and um you know just like I had one one client you know I'm I'm not gonna say but you know c-suite level um and we were meeting another group of people I was in his car and then he just really wanted to know exactly how much money was I making off his business 
And it was like, man, I don't think you would have asked that to another. Yeah. I just don't think there were, it's like, no, yeah. there was no level of respect. Yeah. It was just like, okay. I, hmm. And that's the thing, right? Often it's those, it's those moments that are so subtle and you just get this gut feeling yeah. If I were a man, would that have happened? But you can't prove it. I can't prove anything. Any, it was yeah. like, so, really? so it, and that's what builds the culture of, of um, marginalization, you know, because it's often those real microaggressions that are hard to, hard yeah. to pull people up on. Because right. if you do, they'll just say what? They'll, you know, yeah. like make it out that it, you, it's all in your head. Yeah. And maybe he would have asked a guy that, I don't know. Yeah. But like, I think it was just more, I felt like it was a lack of respect mm-hmm. and it's like, why would he have a lack of respect for me? And it's like, is it cause I'm a woman? I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, it's just really interesting things like just yeah. experiencing, but I definitely experienced much more of that when I had an ad agency than I do now as a coach mm-hmm. for women. And I love being in the space as a coach for women. Sometimes I kind of forget that some of those things are happening because it's such a positive environment, you know, that, you know, when you put yourself in context of like, you're out at dinner and people are talking, I do sometimes kind of get like, they still look to my husband who is no longer really working. And like, you know, I want to know all about his business. And I'm just sitting there going, "Uh uh-huh. I'm, I'm the breadwinner of the family. Yeah. It's just fascinating. It's just how people are. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it's, it's so cool yeah. to just, it's, it's wild to lift up women. It and really is. I love that. That's your focus at Forbes. I have a question. What has been the most exciting Forbes feature you've done so far? Oh my God. Um, I know you've done a lot of cool ones. I'm putting you on the spot. What has been one of those exciting? I mean, Obviously, like I love the piece I did with you, and that's still the one of the most popular pieces I've ever really? written. Um, yeah, it's still one of the most popular. Um, I think a piece that I was really proud of was um, one I did around um, black women in the workplace, and mm-hmm. then I essentially gave my platform to a group of women to share their experiences. Wow. Um, And that felt like a really good use of the platform that I built there, you know? So I was really, I was really proud of that one. But yeah, there's been so many at this point that it's kind of, it's really hard. There's, I think there's ones that I'm proud of in different ways, you know? Yeah. Ones where I just really like my writing or I feel like I got some really good advice out of somebody and others because I think, oh, I think that could have made an impact for someone or a lot of people read it and I'm like oh that obviously resonated um and then you know ones where people who I've interviewed ended up it was a huge boost to their business you know for example I interviewed a woman recently who had actually been discriminated against at work when she told them she was having a baby and I know that's Mm. that happened to you right um and so she and she had to take a job in her local um you know, like corner store to, to pay her mortgage. Um, But then a couple of years later, she set up a business and she helps other women who've been through the same experience find better jobs. And she writes CVs and cover letters for them. Oh, wow. She used to work in recruitment and she knows how to write them. So they pass all the um, tech keyword oh, system wow so that's something i wouldn't even it. think about now you're right yeah, yeah. Well, that's that is brilliant i love that yeah and she you know and i wrote about her and she also what i loved about her is she does a pay it forward scheme so women who don't necessarily need the service but want to pay for it for someone else who maybe that's can't awesome. afford it she does that and it just is like just a whole great it was just a great story and it really had a good impact for her and her business and I think a lot of people you know she just gave some great advice so those pieces like that are always so good really great for me and you know I've had so many women message me about the piece we did together who are like it's so great to see you writing about women over 50 Mm -hmm. becoming entrepreneurs and I felt so inspired and I think that's the point right (laughs) Yeah. You know, okay. and I, I tell you, you know, I know you're younger than me. I have two daughters in their twenties and they're 
they're aspiring at some point, they'll probably be entrepreneurs, you know, um, they're, they're, they were so inspired by that piece. And it was everything, what you, I remember you saying, there's something in the, you know, in the media that we hear where you have to have made it, done it, everything like wrapped up by the time you're 35. And I've got a 28 year old as this comes out, you know, 26 year old, that's a lot of pressure. And just showing them like I'm Mm -hmm. 55 now, you know, that article, I was 54, like you get to have a longer runway and it doesn't mean you're not relevant. And this idea that somehow you're not at 50 is such crap. Yeah. And I I just, I I'm so grateful that you uh, featured that because that's the story. I just delivered it. I mean, that's the story. And I just just want all women to know that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, Bianca, thank you so much for being here today. I just oh, so my enjoyed pleasure. this. Yeah, it's so great. I love this um, so much. Oh, I could too. keep talking and talking. I could too. <laughs> I could keep talking, talking. Now we really need to open the wine for real. Oh yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, you guys, um, we will drop uh, where to follow Bianca, all of that good stuff for you guys. You definitely should. And um, reach out to us if you're thinking, I would love to work with her and we can probably make it happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, yeah. I would love that. Yeah, I absolutely. Know. Yeah, she's been. Well, phenomenal. this is, yeah, this has just been so great. You know, I, yeah, I've loved talking about this. And I hope, you know, I think if, hey, here we are, we want to add some value too, right? So I just hope that everyone, if there's one thing you take away from this conversation, I think it should be, to not be afraid to think big about what you want to achieve um, and particularly in your doing your own PR and also um, don't take for granted what you already have achieved because there'll be somebody out there who wishes they have what you have now and they'll want to know how you went about it and how they can make that happen for themselves so already right there there's something you can pitch to the media There you go. You heard it from the journalist herself, from Bianca Barrett. (laughs) I love how you wrap that up. That's so great. You should come and wrap every one of my podcasts up. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And I know we'll be talking soon. I really appreciate you, Bianca. Bye, everyone. My pleasure. Bye. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks for listening to Brandon Bisbills with your host, Debbie White. Visit franklydeb.com where you can connect with us and join our free Facebook community where all the brand action happens. And I love hanging out on Instagram. So follow me there at frankly Deb and join us next time for another episode of brand and biz bills. Let's get real on women growing powerful brands.